Hello, everyone. We'll be starting the seminar shortly, another minute or so. Thank you so much for your patience. Hello, everyone. I think we might start the webinar. So, welcome, everyone. This seminar is part of our flagship seminar series hosted by the Daffodil Centre. I'm Nemet Hussami. I'm Professor of Public Health and MBCS Chair in Breast Cancer Prevention. I lead the Breast Cancer Clinical and Population Health Stream in the Daffodil Centre and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I'd like to start by acknowledging the country that the Daffodil Centre founding institution, the University of Sydney and the Cancer Council New South Wales are built on, and to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and offer my respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be present today. I would also like to welcome all our international presenters and our attendees. Thank you for joining us for today's event. I'll start with some housekeeping. A reminder to the audience um, that the Q&A function will be active throughout today's presentation. If you have questions, Please use the Q&A function and after the presentations, we will have the panel discussion and tackle some of those questions. I also want to um, say that unfortunately, uh, Professor Phillips uh, will not be presenting today due to some unforeseen circumstances, but we have our international presenters who will join us, who will join us shortly. The Daffodil Centre is a joint venture between the Cancer Council of New South Wales and the University of Sydney. Um, the flagship seminar series is an initiative of the Daffodil Centre to bring together international experts in the field of cancer research and cancer control to discuss important internationally relevant issues in cancer. Today's seminar focuses on breast cancer prevention. And as I said earlier, you will shortly hear from leading international cancer researchers who have done large-scale trials and studies in breast cancer risk and prevention. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, just another couple of minutes, if you'll bear with me. Um, Vahini, can I have my slide, please? So I just wanted to start off by um, saying that we all know breast cancer is common. Um, we don't really even have to go through the statistics. They do vary slightly from country to country. But the bottom line is breast cancer places a high global burden in terms of cases as well as death. What I, what I have on my slide is simply the spotlight um, from WHO's IARC in 2021, which featured breast cancer and that was that's due to the fact that breast cancer uh, cases have increased um, enormously to the point where it has become the most commonly diagnosed cancer globally. And what you see on the slide is just the number of estimated cases as well as deaths. So we have a common, a very common cancer that places an enormous burden in terms of illness and death. And what we have is um, 
an effective secondary prevention strategy for mammography screening, which has been shown to reduce the risk of breast cancer death. But today, we are focusing on primary prevention of breast cancer. So, without further ado, we will move on to hearing from our international speakers. I am delighted, indeed, I'm actually honoured to be introducing today's keynote speaker, Professor Graham Colditz. Professor Colditz is an, is an internationally recognised leader in cancer prevention. He is Associate Director of Prevention and Control at the Cyprus Cancer Centre and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He is a night game professor in the School of Medicine. As an epidemiologist and global public health expert, he has a long-standing interest in the preventable causes of chronic disease, particularly cancer, and has made major contributions to our knowledge in cancer risk factors and cancer prevention. He also um, has interest in translating research findings into effective prevention strategies. Professor Colvis has also developed a website for disease risk to assess individual risk and communicate tailored prevention messages to the public. I would really need over an hour to do his contributions to cancer uh, research and knowledge justice. So I will stop here. And again, it's my honor to introduce Professor Colvis. Over to you, Graham. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And in the next half hour, I will move fairly quickly through some uh, key insights and messages that we can follow here. First of all, I have uh, really no financial relationships to disclose, but acknowledge that Siteman Cancer Center funds our ongoing work and the web tools that uh, were just mentioned. So I will talk about the global burden. Again, we just heard uh, large and growing. Uh, really try to focus on the fact that breast cancer is preventable. Uh, and so it behooves us to take that seriously, capitalizing on opportunities. Look at what is driving breast cancer, come back to prevention and what we can do uh, right now. The global burden are really increasing. You can see um, heading higher, um, 17 uh, million new cases of cancer, that's men and women. When we look in women, uh, over 2 million new cases each year. And this is the leading cancer in women. Importantly, uh, nearly one in four cancer cases diagnosed in women globally is breast cancer. And to me, this says we have uh, enormous priority to focus on the primary prevention, uh, moving beyond just screening early detection and improved survival. So a challenge becomes uh, when and where do we bring the focus to uh, primary prevention? Hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll uh, come closer to agreeing that it's really across the whole of life. It's not something we can put off to the future. And so, um, we'll move pretty quickly through the burden to thinking more about the evidence for prevention. Just to remind you, this is one of the places Australia might lead the world in the actual incidence of breast cancer per 100,000. Not a place that you might want to be as a world leader, but uh, clearly uh, reflecting high income countries at the top of the league table for incidents. Importantly, we should also celebrate successes of decreasing mortality that spans now 
uh, 25 years. And this really reflects the introduction of screening programs for early detection and then uh, introduction of more effective treatment for breast cancer once it's diagnosed. So Australia is set with a breast screen program aiming at women 50 to 74 years of age. And for me, one of the unanswered questions here that we still are working on uh, in our cancer centre catchment, the region of southern Illinois and eastern half of Missouri, is fine to start screening at a, a defined age, but how do we have a risk discussion at an earlier age? How do we identify um, high-risk women who might be uh, recommended for screening at an earlier age? How do we bring the discussion of prevention into routine care? So a key to that is accepting the notion and reality that breast cancer is preventable. It's not, there's a big statistic, one in eight, whichever number a country settles on, um, but really thinking this is a cancer where risk accumulates across the life course. And so we really should be thinking of the potential to prevent uh, breast cancer from an early age. We've written uh, over a decade ago now about some of the broader social reasons that we're not actually maybe capitalizing on what we know about breast cancer prevention in the general public, there's been skepticism that cancer is preventable, probably beyond smoking and lung cancer, moving that understanding and acceptance that we can actually prevent cancer is a challenge we work with. A lot of our research is focused on typically in the US up to five years. And so that impacts our study design so that we can actually do studies and get results in the funding time frame, And then to also be able to show we get benefits, um, we're typically starting in higher risk populations, whether that's for family history, other genetic drivers, or older ages. And if risk accumulates across the time, course of life from birth, childhood, adolescence into uh, early adult years, then how do we bring interventions early and show the benefits maybe decades later? So in terms of what we might call generally accepted uh, medical types of interventions to uh, prevent breast cancer, we have strong evidence that for women carrying the BRCA1 and 2 genes, a very small portion of the population, but we know that um, removal of the ovaries halves the risk of subsequent breast cancer. We also know that tamoxifen and raloxifen are recommended and available for high-risk women, but again, we've got to be able to identify them and bring an appropriate a chemo preventive strategy uh, to that discussion. And Dr. Torriola will talk more about uh, strategies that he is developing. Weight loss, easier said than done. Uh, weight loss and keeping it off an even bigger challenge. But again, there's strong evidence that weight loss of 10 kilograms or more uh, in midlife can substantially reduce risk of subsequent breast cancer. And then really after the Women's Health Initiative randomized trial results came out, there was a global reduction in use of estrogen plus progestin therapy by women and over a 10% reduction in breast cancer that followed that sort of sweeping change in prescribing uh, across high income countries. But if we look back at the accumulating evidence on the prevention of breast cancer, we actually go back to some of the early classic studies of migrant populations and 
change in risk across generations after migrating. And here, breast cancer was one of the uh, early cancers studied in populations migrating to the US. And um, you've done the same in Australia with the Melbourne cohort with skin cancer studies in uh, Western Australia. Uh, these really are able to show us that we can hold the genetic profile stable across families and see substantial changes with the, of risk with the lifestyle changes that go with migration. So really cracking open the potential, if we could understand more, we could bring that scientific knowledge to bear and ultimately um, prevent breast cancer. So uh, looking specifically at breast cancer, Korea, which you probably are all well aware was really subsistence fishing culture uh, before the Second World War has seen a massive increase in incidence here, separate birth cohorts plotted out. And we see that um, in a pretty short time frame across birth cohorts, uh, rates of breast cancer have gone from the lower typically uh, Asian incidence from the last half of last century uh, to really being the same as American women in the more recent birth cohorts. And again, holding the genetic profile constant, we can look within China and there's a substantial difference between rural and urban women. Um, again, they're not changing their genetic profile if they have moved to urban settings, but obviously lifestyle has changed. And again, the incidence in the urban setting is approximating what is seen in the US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so forth. And so one of the interesting studies in China was to look at the changes in um, the actual age at onset of menstrual periods or menarche in the birth cohorts. Uh, on the left-hand side here, we have the year of birth. So women born in 1930 to 1940 had onset of periods around 16 years. That's come way down for women born in the 70s to 14 and continuing on down. If we look at the year of first birth at 19 or 20, these are obviously in 1950, the women born back in 1930, and they're having their first birth not too long after the onset of their menstrual periods. Whereas as we come through to more modern times, age at first birth has uh, really escalated up to 27 and more, really reflecting what is happening uh, with economic transition and uh, middle and high income countries. So dramatic shift in reproductive uh, profiles and breast cancer incidents are reflecting that. So we pull more data on growth, height, um, age at menopause, uh, hormone use, and across all of these data, there's strong evidence that within a population, there can be substantial variation. Now we can't change our height and we can't really change our age at menopause, but these types of data and evidence really make clear that this is not a foregone conclusion that we have to uh, go through economic transition development and end up with uh, breast cancer. We need to really find the uh, pathways and strategies to reduce risk. So one approach to pull all these risk factors together, uh, Malcolm Pike had a really elegant summary of the evidence back in the 1980s, where he basically said with the onset of uh, menstrual periods, breast tissue uh, went through a monthly cycle of growth proliferation with the hormones. And so he assumed that breast tissue started aging at the onset of menstrual periods and then continued 
We know from epidemiologic evidence that uh, having children lowers risk. So he fitted that to his model. And we know that after menopause, risk of breast cancer increase per year is substantially slower than before menopause. So he knocked that down. And then really with the um, encouragement from Chris Bain, who was uh, visiting us in Boston, uh, Chris challenged us to actually try to validate Pike's model in the prospective nurses health study. So I was young and naive and thought that was a great idea. And so working with Bernie Rosner now for uh, over 20 years, we initially tried to move from Pike's model to say, we can see breast tissue begin to age at onset of menstrual periods. We know first pregnancy has an adverse effect. So we let that be a bump here. The rate of accumulating risk goes down with being one or more uh, pregnancies. And so we continued to lower the rate of tissue aging with each additional pregnancy and then a final drop at menopause. And when we integrate the area under that uh, curve, we actually end up with something like an incidence curve for breast cancer. And we see that the uh, interval from menarche to first pregnancy, the rate of tissue aging as we had previously is the greatest. The slope continues to slow and then is slowest after menopause. And when we fit this to nurses and then in external validation in the teacher study, we see that that rate of increase in risk is about 9% per year from menarche to first baby, all the way through to only about 2.5% per year after uh, menopause. Now, of course, you also can see from the plots of the China data, we know what's happened in Korea and other countries, we've actually stretched this interval from first menstrual period to first baby, high income countries in uh, Europe and Australia, you're heading to population average age at first pregnancy of 30 and menarche down at 13 or lower. So we've really stretched this from three years to 17 and 20 years, um, much longer interval at this higher rate of increase. Uh, menopause hasn't changed for centuries in terms of the timing of natural menopause. And so we've really cranked up the population uh, burden. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna wait till women turn 50 and have their first mammogram to even talk to them about prevention. Can we do more once mammography starts and that breast health uh, visit may be scheduled more regularly? And what might we even do after age 75 if mammography screening stops around that age? And of course, this question leaves empty decades of life from birth through to age 50. What are we talking? to women about what is the advice on lifestyle, prevention, wellness, and so forth. So we know a third of breast cancer can be diagnosed globally before age 50. So to wait till age 50 uh, to even begin this discussion is really missing an enormous opportunity to impact women's health. So let's think about what we can offer when across those 50 years should we be acting uh, and where do we get this evidence? Actually, the um, International Agency for Research on Cancer has reviewed the uh, carcinogenic effect of a number of lifestyle factors and alcohol uh, clearly concluded to be a known breast carcinogen. Uh, back in 2007, going through their really rigorous review of the human evidence, the mechanistic pathways, uh, and so forth. So this is uh, substantially more than just the epidemiologic evidence that's brought together when 
the agency does a complete review of the carcinogenic effect of an exposure such as alcohol. In terms of the healthier components of diet, we've got many epidemiologic studies looking at soy, fiber, fruits and vegetables, vegetable protein intake compared to animal protein. And we'll see in a minute, these are resoundingly um, protective when we put all of the human evidence together. Now, physical activity, another a really strong protective component being studied uh, across different age periods in a woman's development and life course. Uh, and again, in some of our work in nurses, the strongest um, prevention similar to what Leslie Bernstein had reported uh, years ago, suggestion that sort of the level of physical activity through the adolescent years was one of the uh, strongest uh, protective components of lifestyle uh, for breast cancer across the life. So we put some of the dietary evidence together in a systematic review of over 30 epidemiologic studies. And that's summarized here in this slide that in fact gives very clear evidence for reduction in breast cancer, both diagnosed in premenopausal women and in postmenopausal women with high compared to low plant-based dietary patterns, and even more importantly, I think, the finding that for receptor negative breast cancer, the subset of breast cancer that we have the least effective treatments for, across the studies, we see the strongest protection from a plant-based diet. Now, there's variation across studies, but putting the 30 studies together, this was a clear message and a clear uh, preventive strategies available. So we can say pretty easily avoid alcohol to lower risk, zero is best, uh, increase fruits, vegetables, fiber, nuts, and do that across the life course, uh, exercise from adolescence on, these components of lifestyle all have clear uh, benefits, and some of these have been further translated through uh, to cohort studies looking at adherence to the healthy lifestyle uh, recommendations and uh, substantially lower risk of breast cancer during decades of follow-up. There are other uh, carcinogens that are known and uh, certainly recommended to avoid. We want to avoid uh, radiation excessive, and this clearly guides treatment for uh, lymphomas and other episodes that women in particular can be exposed to radiation. We know that family history is a clear risk factor for breast cancer, but again, strong evidence that all these modifications to lifestyle can also translate to lower risk, even in those with a family history. And so uh, again, we can craft messages that are applicable to all women across the risk spectrum of breast cancer risk. Our work and others have really pointed to early life diet, um, dairy and other uh, animal products increasing uh, growth and lifetime breast cancer risk. So again, pointing to uh, early intervention with more plant-based diet. The troubling evidence on alcohol, particularly in the US, has been that women have caught up and overtaken men in teenage and young adult years. So again, sticking to this uh, message that zero is best for, for health, um, physical activity uh, mentioned 
And the challenge becomes how do we move beyond the individual uh, responsibility here to societal change to achieve this? Um, we can think of family as one place to start to influence the behavior across the whole life course, but we know we need access to safe space for physical activity year round, etc. Um, so it's not just all loaded back on uh, women as um, individually uh, responsible. So Dr. Torriola will talk a little more, but I want to sort of also ask us, how do we actually look at the um, potential to capitalize on the mammogram? And uh, Dr. Torriola will talk through breast density, but we've been working and these data were presented recently at the AACR meeting to point to uh, putting together multiple components of risk to better summarize uh, a woman's a risk over the next five or 10 years. And so we have questionnaire risk factor data like the lifestyle factors, we have mammographic density and even a polygenic risk score that can add together to stratify risk. We validated that for a five and 10 year risk. So then we need to think not just what the time horizon is for um, prevention, but that it's long enough for a preventive intervention to actually pay off. And there's this challenge, the US is going for five years for breast, but most other chronic diseases focus on a 10 year risk. So Canada is trying to study how to implement this sort of uh, risk stratification. Uh, so they're having women complete a um, score on a web tool, collect spit to do RNA, DNA sequencing and SNP scores and bring this all together. And we're asking, can we actually make more use of the mammographic image since so many women close to 80% are up to date on screening in the recent past. Can we actually add more than just breast density? And again, Tunji will talk about how breast density can guide prevention, but is there even more use that we can be making here? Are we able to stratify women out um, and actually get the lifestyle messages as part of actually having the mammogram and risk uh, discussion as a key component of framing uh, breast health and prevention so that we're actually bringing the right prevention strategies to the right women at the right time. And so we go back to the question of when that discussion of risk should start. Should we do a better job of tailoring the prevention message so it's not one size fits all, not all 50 year old women are the same uh, and so on, so that we can actually um, bring messages that resonate with women that actually can then help them take action to um, modify lifestyle, lower risk and lower the burden of breast cancer. So there's still a lot of work to do. The US has uh, got new funding being launched to reconsider how we frame messages around really the level of risk rather than a common message for every woman around the issues of mammography. And so while there's much work ongoing, we already know enough about the um, role of early life and diet and growth and lack of physical activity, a range of changes that have uh, come across our society with increasing socioeconomic development how do we turn this around to uh, bring 
prevention messages and lifestyle guidance back to women so that they and their children, in fact, are getting the lifestyle interventions that will maximize the risk reduction. We're bringing that at the right time in their life course. Um, and then we're able to reinforce that across society. And when we get to that, we will be in a position to substantially lower the overall population burden. And we can have discussion after we finish these talks, but you know, one of the remaining challenges is can we do a better job of identifying low risk women? A lot of the public health focus has been, can we identify high risk women and maybe start screening earlier for them? But can we in fact identify very low risk women and even delay uh, screening if they're at such low risk? So a range of questions on risk stratification and then how do we communicate that uh, effectively with women and uh, if we can bring our tools together with women to, to really stratify out risk and uh, guide the um, lifestyle through to chemo prevention and screening frequency, uh, if we put that all together, we can substantially um, reduce the burden of breast cancer. So our simplest uh, messages at this stage come down to uh, the plant-based uh, diet as a major uh, shift to lower risk, aim for zero alcohol to lower risk, um, do whatever we can to increase um, physical activity. So uh, don't be constrained to think we've only got walking or jogging or some other single approach to being physically active. Um, and then I haven't talked really much length about weight, weight gain and its overall contribution to a breast cancer risk, but this also is substantial. And so the benefit of avoiding the adult weight gain that really drives much of high income uh, country populations to end up overweight and obese. How do we sustain our weight over 10 and 20 years rather than gaining weight? And with that, lower risk of breast cancer and a range of other cancers that all track with uh, increasing weight. So can be thought of as you know, these are fairly simple, healthy lifestyle that will benefit diabetes, heart disease, stroke, breast cancer, colon cancer, and a range of other cancers. Um, but bringing this about as a, an overall population change um, turns out to be harder than it looks, but the benefits are unarguable, uh, and it's really up to us with a public health focus to, uh, I think, do a much better job of communicating the benefits of these changes uh, so that we can really get the return on investment of all the research that's been ongoing in this space for the last 50 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Paulis, for that. Um, very insightful um, and, and thought-provoking presentation, getting us to think about um, doing more in terms of breast cancer prevention at an earlier phase in the lifespan, um, and not so much focusing on what we do later from 45 or 40 or 50 onwards uh, alone, but we'll come back to that. Um, and, and discuss it a little bit more, hopefully, during the panel session. Um, and before I introduce our next international speaker, I just want to remind the audience to use the Q&A function to ask questions about each speaker's presentation or questions more generally around breast cancer prevention. Please use the Q&A function 
we will have ample time at the end of the presentation to um, provide you an with answers. So um, thank you again, uh, Professor Kozitz. I would now like to introduce our next speaker. A big welcome to Professor Toriola. Professor Tunji Toriola is Professor in the Division of Public Health Sciences at the School of Medicine um, in Washington University in St. Louis. Um, his research focuses on diverse aspects of breast density to identify those women who might be targeted, targeted in um, breast cancer prevention approaches. Professor Toriola is a principal investigator on three NIH grants on mammographic breast density, including a clinical trial investigating the effect of modification of breast density. Um, and he's also investigating the metabolic profiles of mammographic breast density in premenopausal women. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that uh, from him. So over to you, Professor Toriola, and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for inviting me to um, present our work here. Um, thanks to Dr. Coldis for that wonderful overview. So I would be um, coning down a little bit more. The title of my talk is Targeting Mammographic Breast Density in Breast Cancer Prevention. And I'll provide an overview. And then um, in the latter second half of the talk, focus on some of the work that we are doing in this space. Um, breast density is an established risk factor for breast cancer, um, higher breast density that is. It's been shown um, over time in several studies all over the world that women who have high breast density have um, a fourfold increased risk of breast cancer compared to women who have um, um, in the lower percentile of density. Um, for instance, um, figure image half air is a woman with extremely dense breast. And if you compare this woman's breast cancer is to this woman with um, figure hair here, which is, um, which is um, fibroglandular areas, the breast cancer risk associated with that is fourfold, and in some studies, sixfold. Of all the breast cancer risk factors that confer a greater than fourfold increased risk, potentially mammographic density appears to be the one that could be modified. Studies done by the Breast Cancer Consortium has shown that um, the proportion of breast cancer cases attributable to having um, extremely dense breast or heterogeneously breast death is quite high. And in premenopausal women, it's been estimated that 39% um, of breast cancer cases could be potentially reduced um, if women's breast densities are reduced from extremely dense and heterogeneously dense to um, fatty areas of fibroglandular tissues. And in postmenopausal women, um, this figure is about 26%. These are very high numbers. And of course, it's also a reflection of the prevalence of um, um, having dense breast in the, in the society. In addition to being a strong risk factor for breast cancer, it's been shown that mammographic breast density and breast cancer share very similar biological and genetic pathways. For instance, in this one of this first study here, um, the investigators conducted a risk um, profile and discovered that women within the top 10 percentile of mammograph increased mammographic density, higher density, they have a 31% increased risk of breast cancer to those within the um, lowest 10 percentile of genetic profile. And a recent study published just within the last two years has also identify um, 31 loci, mammographic density loci, that are also associated with breast cancer risk. Um, this also um, emphasizes the shared genetic and also um, biological pathways that these two um, factors share. It's been shown that a decrease in breast density over time is also associated with a decrease in breast cancer risk. And this is a meta-analysis that was published last year. And this is non-interventional studies, just looking at um, people who had a um, reduction in density over time compared to those who had, whose, whose density stayed the same. And I will emphasize again that these are observational studies. And you can see um, there is a 22% reduction in um, risk of breast cancer among those whose 
mammographic breast density reduces over time compared to those whose density stayed the same. And depending on the type of study design, this um, risk estimates um, varies a little bit, but um, even when in case control studies, I mean, you still see a reduction, even though the um, confidence interval here crosses one. So the question is, um, if mammographic breast density is related to an increased risk of breast cancer and a decrease in mammographic breast density over time, could be related to a reduction in breast cancer risk. So it behoves on us to start looking for ways to reduce a mammographic breast density as a function of breast cancer um, prevention. But so far, we have limited understanding of the biological basis of mammographic breast density, and there's limited data on how dense breast um, can be reduced to reduce breast cancer risk. We do know that alcohol intake is possibly related to mammographic density and also breast cancer risk, but for mammographic density and alcohol intake, the risk, the, um, risk level uh, ratio is rather weak. Obesity is inversely associated with a uh, mammographic breast density, and we have shown that um, obesity or body mass index actually accounts for 26% or a quarter of the variance in mammographic breast density. And because there's an inverse association, we cannot target um, reducing BMI in reducing mammographic breast density. There is not convincing data that this physical activity can have an impact on a mammographic dens density. And I'm aware that there is a clinical trial that is that is going to be initiated um, at um, uh, initiated somewhere in the US soon, looking at the role of physical activity in reducing mammographic density. And until then, we still don't have very and clear evidence on the role of physical activity. Hormone replacement therapy use increases mammographic density and stopping it reduces mammographic density. But this is only relevant to um, postmenopausal women. Um, and diet, adult diet, the role of adult diet in mammographic density is still equivocal. There is no evidence that adult diet is actually with mammographic density. We don't know yet um, for um, childhood diet. So that's that's a a fatal area of research. So we have been trying to look at other ways to reduce mammographic density to get us to a reduction in breast cancer and breast cancer risk of development. And we um, reviewed a we reviewed um, clinical trials on this in this space just um, and this was published last year. And um, so far, and this was focused on premenopausal women because um, our target has always been on premenopausal premenopausal women because um, the potential benefit of a reduction in mammographic density on breast cancer is, is likely to be much higher in premenopausal women compared to postmenopausal women. In this review, we found that seven studies so far have looked at um, whether chemo prevention agents could have an impact on mammographic breast density in premenopausal women. And as you can see, most of these studies are dated. They were conducted um, over 20 years ago. The most recent one was on vitamin D, which was um, about five years ago. And um, you can see the studies range in quality from good quality studies. Um, for instance, only two of the studies looking at changes in mammographic density due to chemo prevention agent actually adjusted for age and BMI. And we know that these are the biggest determinants of mammographic density. So that calls to question um, really how um, robust um, this, um, some of these trials are. And these are the findings um, for um, the clinical trials. Um, tamoxifen, uh, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, was associated with a reduction in mammographic density. And um, that's um, the IBIS trial by, um, Kuz, led by Kuzik. The gonadotropin receptor agonist also um, was associated with reductions in mammographic density, but the reductions in the reductions in mammographic breast density were rather minimal. And studies have shown that for women to have a benefit from a reduction in mammographic breast density on breast cancer risk, the um, reduction in mammographic breast density over time would be at least a 10% reduction over time. Um, Tamoxifen has been able to achieve that. And I, even though I did not include this because this was reported after uh, we published this, there is another study out of Sweden that show that low dose tamoxifen is also associated with the reduction in mammographic density. And the other agents were not associated with mammographic reductions in mammographic density. And this agent here, this is a, an interesting study. Um, 
the study quality is rather poor. It shows that there was a reduction in mammographic density, but if you dig down into the quality, actually, um, it, it's a really poor quality study, and I would not really place too much emphasis on that. So, so far, the only agent that has been shown to reduce mammographic density in a clinically appropriate form in premenopausal women is tamoxifen. But we also know that tamoxifen comes with a lot of side effects, adverse effects in premenopausal women, which significantly limits its use. And that's one of the reasons why um, trials are looking at low-dose tamoxifen and mammographic density and breast cancer risk. In a study published in the US, it was shown that um, less than 0.3% of women who are eligible to use tamoxifen for chemo prevention actually use it because of um, the side effects. And this is just um, data from the IBIS trial showing that tamoxifen really does reduce uh, mammographic breast density. And the reduction in breast cancer risk that was seen as a result of tamoxifen and chemo prevention was only seen among women who had a greater than 10% reduction in mammographic breast density. So this brings us to the question that um, if tamoxifen um, is, can reduce density and it can also reduce breast cancer risk, but it's not really being used because of the side effects, we need to start identifying other pathways that we can target in reducing mammographic density and could potentially have utility in breast cancer prevention. So we have been looking at the role of the receptor activator of nuclear pathway um, in, in mammographic density and also um, observational studies and clinical trials. The RAN pathway is essential for um, bone morphogenesis, but over the last 10 years, studies have also um, really um, highlighted its role in progesterone signaling, its role in um, mammary gland development, and also in preclinical models, its role in um, develop breast mammary tumor development in preclinical models. And work done, um, seminar work done in, um, by um, Lindemann's lab has shown that um, if you inhibit Rankligan signaling in experimental animals, you reduce their risk of developing breast cancer. And I'm aware that there's a, a phase two clinical trial being targeted in women with BRCA1 mutations as a result of this um, preclinical studies. So we are focused on the role of the rank pathway in mammographic breast density. And we do have a series of studies um, that has led us to this path. In the first study, um, which we published about five years ago, we showed that um, higher breast tissue gene expression of rank and tumor necrosis factor, which is the super family to which the rank pathway belongs to um, in premenopausal women is possibly related to higher mammographic breast density. Um, going further, we um, this was a pilot study, but it gave us the um, ammunition to go further. We then um, performed a prospective study where we collected blood samples from women. So in 365 women, we measured circulating rank biomarkers, and we observed that higher circulating rank biomarkers were positively associated with a mammographic breast density in premenopausal women as well. One notable finding from this study was that this increased um, breast density associated with circulating rank ligand was limited to only women with higher progesterone level, which um, definitely agrees with the biology and shows that, well, this is going to be a targeted use of a um, rank ligand pathway if you're going to use it in preventing and uh, reducing mammographic density and in breast cancer prevention. Just um, a few weeks ago, we also um, confirmed the associations of rank pathway with mammographic deaths in postmenopausal women. This time around, we used um, plasma rank ligand gene expression, and we noted that um, plasma um, rank gene expression is also possibly associated with um, mammographic breast density in postmenopausal women. And um, these pre observational studies have led us to um, develop phase one and phase two clinical trials, seeing whether targeting rank ligand pathway in, can have an impact on breast tissue markers and also on breast density in premenopausal women. I'll provide an insight into the phase one clinical trial, which we completed about um, three years ago, and we've been doing the analysis in terms of looking at gene expression. What we did here was we recruited 10 um, premenopausal women with dense breasts, who also were at high risk of breast cancer. Um, about six of these women had a positive family history of breast cancer, and the others had um, other, um, other um, factors that put them at high risk of breast cancer. We then, um, at baseline, we had their 
uh, confirm their mammographic breast density and that they had dense breast. We then had a breast biopsy, a cornidal ultrasound guided cornidal biopsy targeting the densest part of the breast and also took a blood sample. We then gave them one subcutaneous dose of Iranclagan inhibitor. Um, and then the women returned 60 days later at the same phase of the menstrual cycle as they had their breast biopsy, the baseline breast biopsy. And they had a repeat breast biopsy as well, and also a blood draw. We've been trying to understand um, what the data means, and we're still working on the data. We did all genome, um, all bulk genome gene, gene expression. And what we found out was that um, Rankligan inhibition um, down-regulated um, pathways within the breast that were associated with um, immune regulation and also inflammatory signaling as well. And um, we also found out that Rankligan inhibition within the breast tissues or regulated um, pathways that were that associated with metabolic signaling and also hormone signaling. One of the things that we're trying to do, this is still um, bulk data, this is still all genome expression. We're trying to go further into looking at single cell sequencing to see whether um, which cells are really involved and whether we can really um, pass this um, data out in a better form. Like I said, we currently have a phase two clinical trial running, which is um, looking at the role of rank ligand inhibition on mammographic breast density um, in premenopausal women. And to be eligible for this study, women had to be premenopausal older than 40 years old, have dense breast on mammogram, and they may be at an increase risk of breast cancer as well. The goal is to randomize 210 women to an intervention arm or a placebo arm. And then at baseline, we'd have have their mammogram, um, have a breast biopsy and a blood draw. And then also at baseline, um, ha in, um, have um, either um, denosumab or placebo. The women then return at six months for a repeat intervention, denosumab or placebo. And they return at 12 months for repeat mammogram, repeat breast biopsy and repeat, um, repeat blood draw as well. And the major goal of this trial is to compare the change in mammographic breast density at 12 months among women assigned to the um, intervention arm and also to the um, placebo arm. And in secondary analysis, we're gonna be looking at um, breast tissue gene expression. Um, as we've learned our lessons now, we're um, storing tissue samples in a way that we'll be able to do other omic analysis as well, um, such as proteomic analysis and proteogenomic analysis, and also hopefully um, single cell sequencing analysis, just to be able to really get to the biology of this, if there are any differences between the intervention arms in terms of mammographic density at 12 months. One of the things, one of the limitations of previous studies was that once um, previous clinical trials on looking at chemo prevention agents and mammographic density was that once the women were off the trials, the women were not followed up to see whether the intervention had a lasting effect beyond, um, beyond the clinical trial period. So um, to minimize that, we are going to be following the, the women up for um, at 24 months and also at 36 months to see whether any changes arising from the intervention is sustained and beyond the intervention period. And this is just um, data showing how far we have gone with the trial. Um, so far we have, um, we, I'd hoped that by this time would have enrolled 140 women, but um, COVID has um, really thrown uh, trials and I'm sure like many other people into a range and our recruitment goals have not really aligned with what we have, um, we have thought, but we're still cruising along fairly well. We've consented 124 women so far. And of those 124 women, um, 97 of them have been put on, onto the trial. And some of the reasons why some of the consented women have not been put on the trial for various reasons. Some of them were recruited at the height of COVID and we could not um, do breast biopsy on these women because of um, shut down in clinical services. So we are hoping that to reconsent those women um, once they're, they're, they're due for their annual mammograms at, again. Like I said, um, we out of the 110, 12 women that have um, been eligible for baseline mammogram, um, 112 have completed. We've completed um, baseline blood draw on 98 of these women. Um, 90, 98 of these women are also eligible for baseline injection, either denosumab or placebo, and 97 of them have completed it. 82 women are 
eligible for, they've reached the six one time point and 67 of them, I mean, 73 of them have completed it. And this is an ongoing process. And we hope that in the next um, few weeks, we'll be able to catch up on um, this six one timeline. Also, um, 72 women have already completed their um, are eligible for 12 month mammogram and 57 of them have completed the 12 month mammogram. And of these 57 women, we've completed 12 month repeat biopsy and blood draw on them. And there are ongoing plans to ensure that we um, complete um, the 12 month biopsy and blood draw on um, the remaining two, um, 15 women in the coming days. We com collect um, toxicity data on the women enrolled in the trial. And we've seen um, the only grade three toxicity that we have identified so far is a small intestinal obstruction, which we don't think is related to the clinical trial. Most of the um, grade two um, um, toxicity are related to um, musculoskeletal disorders and also dental conditions, which are expected given the um, biology of the Ranclagan inhibitor. So in summary, a substantial proportion of breast cancer cases can be attributable to having dense breasts, especially in premenopausal women. It's been shown in observational studies that a reduction in breast density over time could translate to a reduction in breast cancer risk and development. Yet we have limited knowledge on how to reduce breast, dense, um, breast cancer development in women with dense breasts. We have focused on the role of the rank pathway in mammographic breast density and observational studies in our st team has shown that the rank pathway is positively associated with mammographic breast density. We've demonstrated in a phase one clinical trial that rank ligand inhibition impacts um, important pathways, hormonal, human, immune, metabolic, and inflammatory pathways within the breast tissues. And we're already, we're running a phase two clinical trial right now. And it, we hope that a successful demonstration that Ranclagan inhibition can reduce mammographic density in women with dense breasts could open up additional approaches to primary breast cancer prevention in these women, especially in premenopausal women where chemo prevention options are very limited. There's only one chemo prevention option um, that has been approved for use in premenopausal women, that's tamoxifen. In, in postmenopausal women, there have been six that have been approved. So we're hoping that um, this could potentially open up new approaches to chemo prevention in, in premenopausal women. And I would like to thank um, people that have been working um, together with over the last um, nine years. Um, and without their support, um, this would not have been possible. Um, Graham and a lot of the breast radiologists, medical oncologists, and also for funding sources, Komen Foundation that provided us with the first funding um, where we were able to show in um, premenopausal women that rank ligand signaling is related to mammographic density. And um, the clinical trial work has been supported by funds from the Simon Cancer Center and also from the NIH. And I'd also like to thank uh, members of my lab without which um, this work would not have been possible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Toriola. Please um, keep your camera on um, to join the panel um, Q&A. And can I also ask Professor Colditz to rejoin? Thank you. Um, so we have some questions, um, uh, but I just want to thank you, Tonji, for such a, an exciting presentation covering some very innovative clinical style work around breast density. Thank you for that. So um, we have several questions and I'll, we will hopefully get through all of those. But again, um, please, can I remind the audience to use the Q&A function to ask questions? Um, we have, before I forget, there is a specific question about one of your trials. So I might just start with that. Um, I'm curious to know whether use of contraceptives would have affected the rank inhibitor clinical trial. I noticed it wasn't listed on your exclusion criteria. No, we have not excluded um, women who use oral contraceptives, but we take very detailed information on oral contraceptive use. And we, um, the plan is that we're going to um, look into how this, um, I, first of all, controlling for it, and first, second of all, whether it modifies the effect of um, rank ligand inhibition on mammographic density. So yes, we do. Have, um, we're collecting data on um, all sorts of oral contraceptive use. 
Thank you very much. I have um, two questions actually about the same topic of breastfeeding. So if I can ask Graham to answer this. Um, two questions have asked about the role of breastfeeding and preventing breast cancer. Thanks. That's a really interesting biologic question. Um, at this stage, we sort of have done a systematic review meta-analysis of uh, breastfeeding and see a significant reduction in risk with sort of longer duration of breastfeeding and that that protective uh, effect is clear and strong for receptor negative breast cancer again the subset that we have least uh, set of tools for actually treating. Um, of course, just as you know, having more children is not a societal solution for breast cancer, um, actual breastfeeding duration is in fact fairly um, constrained within the um, number of children and then how long a woman can breastfeed. But uh, even within the sort of modern high income countries with you know two children maybe the population average again yes there still is reduction in risk with longer uh, breastfeeding than shorter but obviously not the same impact as our grandmothers and great-grandmothers who probably had five to seven children each and would have breastfed all of them thank you more Questions for you, uh, Professor Collett. This is a, a somewhat actually broad question. Could you comment on whether contraception and also HRT for menopause contribute to breast cancer risk? So the um, question on uh, hormone use, contraception uh, and the menopausal hormone therapy changing formulations over time and across country uh, different countries having different uh, formulations has created some challenges for uh, studying this. And we know from sort of the early studies, prospective and uh, case control for oral contraceptives and breast cancer, that the risk seemed to be limited to the women who were currently using contraception. Um, but the formulations now on the market really are much lower dose than uh, included in those early studies. The issue of um, hormone therapy for menopausal symptoms, uh, again, challenged by formulations, but I think it's clear that combination estrogen plus progestin uh, significantly increases risk of breast cancer, particularly with longer durations, right? So people, what does longer mean? Well, in the epidemiologic sense, we can see with each uh, year of use, risk continues to go up. And so there's not a magic you know, number of years here, um, but a recommendation against uh, longer term use even down to no more than five years of use for, for symptom relief. Um, that's a clearer increase in risk than um, unopposed estrogen. Uh, and there the debate is somewhat confounded by where the evidence comes from, when the hormone therapy begins. Is it at the time of menopause or some years after? Um, but the the use uh, particularly of the combination estrogen plus progestin uh, very clearly increases risk. Other uh, approaches probably carry some risk, but it's uh, less than the combination therapy. Thank you, but more for you, Professor Colbert. Years from onset of menarche first birth is a factor for breast cancer risk. So ideally, how many years between the onset of menarche and first birth before the risk is increased? Yeah. Well, that's, that, this is sort of the challenge of the global transition for women. Um, 
transition of diet um, that has largely driven earlier development, um, the education of women and delaying childbirth. There's no magic here again. Um, the risk is literally going up each year and women who never have children end up with the, the highest risk because they never get the actual final development of breast cells that happens with the first pregnancy. And that change in the cell cycle, um, more DNA repair is shown in animal models and in uh, women. So there's no magic here. Um, one could look again at the, um, even though as a sort of global society, we've stretched that time frame, the um, fruit, vegetable, pulse diet uh, does lower risk. So we can counter some of that societal benefit of education, if you will. Um, and we've certainly also been able to look in the cohorts of children uh, out of, say, the Boston uh, lying in one of the cohorts there that we had access to and analyzed data. Again, children drinking more milk and uh, animal protein grow faster, taller, and have higher risk of breast cancer and other cancers through life than those who've grown up um, with more vegetable protein, uh, vegetable fiber uh, than uh, animals. So that trade-off actually sets a growth pattern and um, lifetime risk. So um, that's, again, where we go for the prevention aspect rather than um, thinking societally we're going to change the, the interval from um, sort of menarche to first baby, yeah. Uh, um, another question for Professor Colditz, is the risk of pre-menarche weight gain on premenopausal breast cancer risk known and is this a potential source of primary prevention? Um, I can take a crack at this, but I know Tunji's also done work in this area in the context of breast density, right? So um, the um, evidence, and Tunji summarized this as one of the first papers that he did after joining faculty with us, looking at the um, potential for the trend in increasing um, childhood obesity or just adiposity is that part of what's driving changes in breast cancer incidence. We then worked through with Dr. Rosner uh, a range of analyses looking at the timing of weight gain is your weight relative to your peers at age 10 driving lifetime risk is weight gain from 10 to 18 impacting risk is gain from 18 to 50 impacting risk. Um, and one of the, I'll still call it fascinating, and it's because I don't have an answer for how this all works, and we'll see if Tunji's got one yet. The When we do analysis of weight gain and uh, breast cancer risk, the adiposity at age 10 down in childhood actually is protective against breast cancer for life. And if you could tell me what the mechanism is, I'll get Tunji to do a trial to try and mimic that and get the lifetime benefit without getting all the consequences of uh, childhood, adolescent adiposity and diabetes risk and other cancer risks. So, um, so maybe I will ask Tunji yeah. if he would like to add. Um, to this fantastic answer. Thank you. Yes, it's, um, I think it's one of the great fascinations why um, adiposity um, at early life actually really impacts um, breast density, I mean, density and also breast cancer risk over time. And I think um, if we can really crack that, uh, we can take prevention hopefully to an earlier 
path. And I think studies coming out from um, the Nurses Health study is beginning to show us um, the um, genetic profile and um, the risk um, gene expression profile that we know could um, be linking um, early life adiposity to um, a reduced risk of breast cancer later on. And some of the um, identified genes have been related to genes in um, um, hormonal gene expression, also NF kappa pathway as well. So I think there is a lot to do there, but we still really don't know what the biological drivers are. Um, over the last one or two years, there's a better understanding. And we've also been trying to look at um, the role of early life adiposity on some of the genes that we've studied in our in our data set and how that could relate to density. And we found an association between early life adiposity and hormonal gene expression, especially estrogen receptor gene expression, and also rank some of the rank pathway um, genes as well. Um, our own analysis was contained because we were feeding off some of the gene expression analysis that we have done. But um, I think the way to go is to continue to do all genome expression and probably all proteomic expression to try and understand some of these biological underpinnings because I think um, that's probably a huge unexplored and untapped potential in breast cancer reduction. Thank you very much. So the next question is perhaps to both speakers. Um, thank you for your talk. So I'm interested in hearing um, when is the best time in a woman's life to have discussions around breast cancer risk factor, so health literacy, informing them so they can better understand the risk of uh, risk factors, the understanding of risk factors at that point and beyond in their lives, or should this be a continuing discussion? Um, if, if maybe twenty first, and I'll pass on to Professor Colbert after that. Yeah, this is some of the questions we've also been trying to walk through. <laughs> and um, um, Dr. Coldis and I on, on a um, panel here that are trying to walk through that. Um, and some of the confusions may be related to the different guidelines that we have in the US. But we feel um, based on evidence that um, women can start talking to their providers as early as possible um, for high risk women in their 20s, late 20s, and that's a good time to start talking about screening and preventative risk. And also for um, women who have family history of breast cancer, maybe by age 40, um, screening, or uh, even lower, age 40 screening, um, mammographic screening could be initiated at that stage because um, we've also noticed that there is an increased risk of breast cancer or there is a rising um, incidence of breast cancer in premenopausal women, especially among women who have positive families through breast cancer. So that's a good time to start initiating the discussion. In the 30s and um, by 40, age 40, women should start having a um, screening mammogram. That's, that's um, yeah, that's the way we have it. I know Graham has other thoughts on yeah. that as well. Yeah. So as you say, Tunji, it's a real challenge here. And one of the questions that's been thrown back to us is so who has this discussion with women is it sort of somewhere through high school and uni you get to start thinking about is it breast cancer risk or is it healthy living right and when does the focus potentially shift specifically to breast um is every GP in the country expected to be fluent in all of the subtleties of risk factors? Is there a more efficient way to um, make these data available to, to women? And then those, as Tunji saying, if they've got family history and higher risk, maybe they need to get to a, a more specialized service, but how does that actually happen and integrate efficiently uh, into how we deliver um, healthcare. Um, you may have a slightly more organized system than some countries, um, but really it seems the, the challenge of um, being able to work from lifestyle to high risk early screening to 
some of the very medical interventions for BRCA families that clearly not every GP is going to have a discussion on uh, BRCA and risk of breast first ovary and so on. So how does that run smoothly for, for women and coordinated care, I think, is one of the challenges. I use the example that Canada is trying to do a trial to understand how to have some of these discussions in two provinces, but that's actually a simplification because the the actual screening guidelines in the two provinces are different. So the, the risk management, even in two province, provinces in Canada, ends up being um, somewhat more complicated than um, just saying like breast screen, well, we've got a strategy and everyone uh, should be able to slot into some predefined approach. They've got two provinces and two different ways to think about risk in uh, women under 50. So, yeah, it's... Yeah, thank, thank you. But, you can solve um, it for us. Yes, I'm just going to kind of, um, just extending a little bit, and, and this is for me, um, so it's going back to the whole literacy issue. So we, we have a breast screening program that is publicly available to all women 40 and over, but targeting 50 and over. So is it... And, we're trying. We're doing research to try and find out if women might be interested in receiving simply information about lifestyle risk factors. Let's say, do you think it's too late, or we're missing we're missing the more important opportunity for prevention if we communicate those messages? Yeah. You know, fourteen, fifty, and older. And um, do you really think that 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 we should try and use that? That opportunity when women come to our organised screening program. Um, so, what are your thoughts on that? So, I um, will jump in, and Tunji can follow. Um, to me, there's definite opportunities that we're missing, right? And accessing the screening program is one. Another that we see, and maybe you've got a fewer error type system, but I've been at other cancer centers at Stanford and elsewhere where colleagues will take me aside and say, well, you know, one of my patients had breast cancer and she was tested for BRCA and she was free. So her younger sister didn't care to get tested. And then when her younger sister hit age 38, she got breast cancer too. And it was like, there's a too simple a solution. Well, if it's early onset, we'll test BRCA. If it's not BRCA, well, you've still got family history, right? And so we've um, almost oversimplified some of this by saying, well, we can test for these known genes and almost overly confident that if you don't have the genes, we've um, sort of finished the risk management. Um, and so that to me is indicative of these missed opportunities for siblings, nieces, extended family, if you will, where um, we know there's risk, but we're not actually capitalizing on it to um, begin and then continue. Some of these discussions are not once and done to sort of think about lifestyle and um, risk. Thank Tundra. you very much. Yeah. 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 One, last, so actually, one last question for Tunji and feel free to uh, um, keep um, commenting on the lifestyle factor question that I had, but I just want to make sure I ask you this question. Um, it, if we go ahead with your inhibitor treatment uh, to modify density, how do we deal with the musculoskeletal related side effects that come with it? That's that's a really really great question. Yes, we are really um, monitoring um, aggressively the women on the trial to see um, what the side effects are. So far, yes, we've um, noticed some women with um, potential bone pain, but so far we haven't seen any women with more than a grade two severity. The other question is um, 
what happens if they use for longer? We don't have that information yet. Uh, most of the data we have is from postmenopausal women, and I believe that hopefully this study would also help us to understand potential, well, short time use of uh, denosumab and potential impact on bone health and also potential um, um, impact on bone and also dental issues in premenopausal women. So I'm hoping, yeah, this is, yeah, this is a great opportunity for us to understand that more. And I'm hoping that what we learn from this would feed our design of potential phase three clinical trials and potential recommendation if this goes into clinical use in future. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we've come to the end of the webinar uh, time. I, I do want to thank uh, all those who joined us, but I particularly thank our two international speakers for providing their time, their expertise, and sharing uh, some of the work that they're doing. We're very grateful that you have been able to join us. I know it's the, the end of a long day for both of you, so thank you very much. And uh, thank you also, to again, to those who joined the webinar. And I hope you all have a good day or good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much.